The next speaker for our last spe uh, speaker for today is uh, Professor Stefano Pampanin. He is currently a professor at the Department of Structural and Geotechnical Engineering at Sapienza University of Rome, Italy. He has been in actively involved as a structural engineering educator, researcher, and practitioner in the specialist field of seismic assessment of rainforest and precast concrete structures. He is the author of more than 100 scientific publications in the field of earthquake engineering, and he also received several awards for his research activities. The topic for his uh, presentation today will be the next generation of precast concrete seismic resilient buildings. The time for presentation is 45 minutes and will be followed by 15 minutes questions and answers. So good morning, Professor Pampanin. Okay, you still mute, okay. Can you unmute? There you are. Okay, okay, time is yours. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me properly now? Yes. Yes. Thanks. Yes, so first of all, uh, first of all, thanks for the organization for the very kind invitation, and uh, it's really a pleasure to see so many colleagues all around the world uh, being connected and uh, being interested in the same uh, in same in the same discussion. I will follow up the presentation of, of Dr. Fernandez, but also the other ones uh, from uh, from Indonesia and from Elematic. Uh, to see from the past to the present to the future what is already happening in terms of innovative uh, solutions for pre-concrete in seismic regions and what we can do. I'm not answering to the question because it's been already answered very properly by David before, what is the best option? I will be just giving you hints about uh, what are the options amongst which you can choose your best options, because very often people are not aware, and when I say people, it's not only designers, it's contractors, it's clients, architects, uh, uh, let's say uh, governor checkers. Uh, so people are not aware or they have prejudice about some solutions. And so they don't even consider them while they might be the best options for your specific case. The first slide is a bit shocking and unfortunately being uh, living through that uh, shock, which was the Canterbury earthquake sequence in 2010, first and then 11, the main earthquake uh, February 22nd of 2011, where where the main city of Christchurch, uh, the capital of South Island, was basically completely destroyed in the city center by a nearby earthquake, not a major man magnitude, we are talking about 6.3, but a nearby earthquake. So if we go through the next slide, uh, it's quite an obvious problem. It's a common problem internationally and uh, often, unfortunately, I say that if you want to move from one nice country to the other nice country, you go through these troublemaking yellow problems, which are earthquakes. People like to live there. I don't need to tell you about your own country, but very, very often people disregard the, the, the intensity of the earthquakes and the concept of risk. Let's remember that the risk is not the probability of occurrence of a big earthquake. The risk is the probability is the combination of the probability of occurrence of an earthquake, which is very high in your country, with the vulnerability of the structure. So for existing structure, it's quite obvious that the more vulnerable a structure is for a given hazard, the more risk the, 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 the building and so the people living in the building will have. But for new buildings, now we are, we are accepting and trying to understand more and more about the risk of preserving the building itself, not only the life safety. So for new design, we should be obviously minimizing or going for zero losses in terms of fatalities. So what we see from earthquakes which have occurred in Indonesia in the past years uh, is something which obviously, obviously no one will ever, ever desire to happen in the future. The reality is that the existing buildings will still perform badly as they are bad. While uh, we have a mandate to start from today or from yesterday to get the next generation of seismic resistant building up in a way that they will not be only strong and stiff but they will be able to deform and it's, not, it's much more about than ductility. It's about uh, preserving the building uh, in addition to preserving the life of people. Let's go back uh, in the 1990s and some presentation already followed in the morning uh, were mentioning the development of uh, the historical development in precast. 
But just to understand how much has happened since 1990s, that was, this was a slide which I was using literally in the late 90s, saying that the use of development of precast concrete in the 90s has been limited, so was limited, by obviously lack of confidence on their performance. What does it mean? Uh, many people were observing collapse of structures. Many of these structures were reinforced concrete, obviously unreinforced masonry, but reinforced concrete as well as precast concrete. So people were associating precast concrete equal brittle, equal problems. And so there was a huge issue in terms in the 1990s about the lack of confidence on the performance. If we add the fact that in terms of code, the design provisions, in terms of preparation of engineers, in terms of literally lectures, that at any university around the world were delivering specifically precast concrete, they were very limited. So on one hand, there was a lack of confidence. On the other hand, there was a, a, a lack of design provisions, which means keep going, lack of confidence because you don't know how to design, because people don't know how to construct, because there would be a premium in the design and in construction means precast concrete is not good, the people will go for steel. So if we look at Northridge 1994, but also the collapse of uh, all core in precast car parking, that was not again an issue of uh, what has already been said very well. It's not an issue of the precast concrete as a material, it's an issue of detailing. So it's an issue of designing. Precast concrete is not good or bad like steel, like uh, masonry is not good or bad, but people should be understanding more and more about uh, the importance of detailing. And I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to, unfortunately, very far away, I would have loved to be there, uh, to discuss with uh, the people from Indonesia because uh, I've been in uh, New Zealand for 16 years. Now I'm back in my own country in, uh, in Italy, but I've been in California for a couple of years uh, during the development of the press technology, which I will tell you, you about. And it's incredible how the same mindset and prejudice uh, were and are still occurring everywhere in the world. In Turkey, 1999, major earthquake occurred and precast industrial buildings made with those hinged connection did not deliver did not perform well, the world collapsed, again, for a matter of detailing. What was the situation in the 1990s? And then I would not be answering, I would be asking you, what is the situation in your own country or in your adjacent country? Just to think about how many of you have ever been taught a full set of courses about precast and concrete, which is not bridges, is precast concrete. And how many of you, when you were students, were ever being brought to a factory to see what is a pre-stressing yard, what is a casting bed, what is an holocore. So if you think that from when you were a student or when you were you know, younger, things did not change significantly, that's the problem. So we saw a major change in India and Professor Spiro Sukantas, a great friend of all of us, has been a pioneer to help and support that uh, major change uh, in, uh, in India, but many other countries have been slowly, slowly considering. So the reason is that there were only a few options. Emulation of casting say to concrete, we are going to go through, but we are we've already seen with the previous presentation, strong connection and jointed ductile connection. And again, I bet, not to you, but I bet that if you were asking to a, an engineer not familiar with precast, if he could just very simply explain what is emulation of casting plates, what is strong connection, what is hybrid connection, they would not have a clue. Why? It was not a part of the normal education of engineers. So it's a very serious issue coming from, coming from education. Uh, the problem is bigger than life safety. When we think about uh, design, it's uh, first of all, obviously, we have to avoid anything like this, which is a full collapse of an industrial building uh, in 1999. Second of all, once we find uh, the proper way to avoid collapse, uh, we need to protect uh, the business. We need to protect the business uh, knowing that for an industrial plant or like this, I make a number, a couple of million, million of euros uh, will be the cost of this uh, precast uh, skeleton. But the content itself, the production of a facility, which is going 24 hours, seven days a week, in a month will deliver more value than the building itself cost. So uh, the lack of operation, which we call a business downtime, is so much important nowadays, the more developed the country becomes and the more developed the facility is. And this is something that unfortunately it was not 
in the radar in the 1990s. In the 1990s, the problem was to save life. And now is not anymore the problem. The saving life is the priority. In addition to that, we obviously have to add the value and value engineering to what we are doing. And this will become a completely different paradigm. So I go back to the question that you posed, a very good question. What is the best option? The answer is up to you, but remember, please, that is not about the first cost of bringing up the building. It's life cycle cost. And let's not go for fancy sustainability algorithms to tell us what is the fully life cycle analysis. Let's just consider how much the maintenance and how much the downtime, if any, you will be paying without an insurance or with the insurance premium to keep up your business. And then it will be very obvious what will be the balance. So it's like being a good family father or family, uh, uh, you know, family self uh, uh, discussing uh, within, the, within the budget and understanding what is going to be the consequence. So if we think about uh, the fundamentals of precast concrete buildings, uh, I really like to go back to what also Dr. Fernandez has been mentioning, uh, the basics of conceptual design, the basic of conceptual uh, detailing, which is uh, bigger and much more than uh, using a computer, running some time history analysis, getting some colors, so some fancy numbers, and then showing to the clients that I'm able to do a dynamic analysis. This is not design. This is playing with, with a, 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 a tool. I could have my kids learning the basics of how to get to level one, level two, level three, and getting points, depending on how much we get ductility or whatever. It's just a matter of explaining the rule of the game and then playing with the software. So the huge issue that we are all facing around the world, and it was a problem in New Zealand, it's a problem in Italy, I don't know, but I guess it's a problem also in your own country, is that the society does not remember anymore what is the role of an engineer. So the society think an engineer is a software player. You buy a software, you play the game, and then you get the numbers. So what's the point of having an engineer? Just a matter of running numbers. Even for, more so, a judge, will think that an engineer makes a mistake because it's a mathematical equation, one plus one equal to two. So if something goes wrong under an earthquake, you are liable. We were trying to explain to the judges in New Zealand that in earthquake engineering, there is no math that is the final uh, tool or ob objective is only a tool. So in Eric engineering one plus one, I was explained to the judge and he understood very properly when I was mentioning that a brick modeled in the computer, the brick and reinforced masonry becoming the model, that's the mistake. It's the accepted mistake called approximation. From there on, there is no mistake in the mathematical equations. The problem is how you model the brick becoming a computer fixed end connection. So there is no one plus one equal to two, but in English engineering, one plus one what could give you whatever numbers you wish or whatever number you don't wish. So the design methodology means going back to the, and that's the Park and Paul in Priestley approach, back of an envelope, back of an envelope, you take a pen and we have to have, be able to check the basic behavior of a building uh, that our younger or older, computer uh, 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 guru will be actually giving us the number. So it's a, a design check, conceptual design, where the forces and the, and the stresses are going. And this is more important than anything. And as you know, force-based design is the older way to do it. It's what we have in the code, but the building don't think in terms of forces. They think in terms of displacements, given ductility is nothing else than a displacement in demand. So it's a where we go divided, you know, the plastic behavior, if you wish, in terms of displacement, there's no forces anymore because, sorry, there is no increase in forces because we have an elastoplastic system. So it's incredible how for many years, we've been using a force-based approach while take away seismic design. If you go back to your static gravity design, you were using a moment curvature. And the moment curvature was a nonlinear static analysis, nothing to do with seismic. But we were looking at plastic hinges, FIB, CB model code 1980s. We were looking at ductility, regardless of seismic, for a good plastic behavior. This is called limit state design versus allowable stress design. So interestingly enough, we took a while to understand that the force-based design in seismic was as inappropriate as allowable stress design. 
And so we need to move to something which is more a limit state, so a plastic behavior, which we were using for gravity since 30 years. And this is the displacement based design in seismic. So don't think about that being something so different for what we've been doing. I teach a course in Italy to engineers slash architects. They don't have big basic uh, basic cell earthquake at all. So we start from scratch and the way to teach them the nonlinear pushover behavior is to tell them again, section analysis in reinforced concrete due to gravity load on a slab, moment curvature, the moment curvature becomes your nonlinear behavior. You can start introducing the activity. Let's keep going. As for gravity, we need to deliver the neutral axis position with the proper detailing, with the proper uh, uh, percentage of reinforcement. So for seismic, we need to detail very properly. And so connection detailing ultimately is what we need to, to provide. Redundancy and robustness is something that we were able to do without a prescriptive code in the past is something that we don't understand anymore nowadays. So it's something which uh, uh, we have seen issues of a collapse, prog progressive collapsing happening or deterioration of different buildings and bridges around the world. And if we have to go through again, this uh, what if uh, approach, what does it mean what if approach? We use it in New Zealand. Think about the design of a building and think what if, uh, the diaphragm will not work properly to deliver the load path to the lateral resisting system. If this does not work properly, do you have a backup plan? Do you have a, a plan B? If you don't have a plan B, that's not a redundant design. As simple as. So very, very simple type of questions that you can ask to each other. And this is the best option to do a peer review of yourself with a colleague to try to understand what if. And the answer to what if cannot be it never happened because it never happened doesn't exist. It never happened to you is not a proof because you have to check around the world if it does happen to someone else or by the basic definition of we don't know what we don't know, there are many mechanisms that we don't know and at each earthquake we are learning new mechanisms. So the back of an envelope uh, rule of thumb, which means uh, take a pen, make a sketch of what are the seismic resistance system, look at the displacement compatibility, the frame is moving a lot, the diaphragm is going to unseat because it's sitting on a ledge of 50 millimeters, it does, it's not good enough. So these are questions that you can answer much better than any computer model. If you don't model into a computer, into a software, the mechanism, the collapse of an of a unseating length, because you did not put a friction slider, it was too complicated, you will never see that collapse mechanism. And eventually detailing, detailing, detailing. So if there is one rule in seismic design that uh, Professor Tom Poli has been taught to the world is, uh, the devil is in the detail. It doesn't matter about forces, about uh, whatever you want, the Q factor, the R factor, these are all fudge mathematical tools if the connection is well, well connected with detailing, the building will survive. If you make the most fancy accurate model in, uh, sorry, potentially accurate model in your, in your time history analysis, but you were not uh, modeling the joist sitting on a, on a, on a, on a unreinforced masonry uh, wall, then you will not be able to see the collapse. Very quickly, I want to go through what you know and what we've seen already in this presentation. Hinge connection has been very typical of precast industrial buildings. Uh, honestly, that was a problem. That was a huge problem because this, this picture is absolutely brilliant. Precast has been developed in the 30 precast pre-stressed, 50s and 60s was the main push everywhere around the world. In Italy, in France, I'm talking about Europe, Italy, France, and Germany pushed very much into precast buildings of this sort in the 50s and the 60s and 70s. But there were no information and awareness of seismic detailing. So this solution is absolutely brilliant and Think, people think now that they are very bad, cannot be used. That's not the problem. This solution of long span, precast, pre-stress, still are brilliant. It's a matter of connection between the element and the element. We should not be using anymore long span, high, uh, uh, long, long columns uh, without any connection with the, with the beam. It is allowed technically, but as uh, uh, David has shown very properly from the FIB bulletin 78, uh, it doesn't take a big uh, computer model to push with a force on the top and then deliver a huge moment to the base. 
And then you see that you have to develop a huge plinth and the huge plinth should have a huge foundation. And once you start having a five by five meter raft foundation under a plinth, the economics uh, doesn't make any sense. If you then add the famous P delta effects, uh, which is the weight by the displacement, uh, and you calculate the displacement at yielding of such a, a, a column can be 15 to 16 centimeter, sorry, I'm using the Italian and Japanese way, 150 to 100 millimeters. The 100 tons, 150 tons multiplied by 150 millimeters of displacement will give you a moment at the base, which is going to basically eat away at least 50% of the capacity. Can you please tell me which software are you using? Don't tell me, think about it. And when you're using a model analysis, which is a response spectrum analysis, can you tell me how P-delta effects are accounted for? Until yesterday, they weren't. So until yesterday, we were not accounting for a humongous amount of extra moment demand because the software was not de de delivering a large deformation theory analysis. Now, more recently, some software are adjusting themselves. So going back to the point, Precast, and I saw very good, uh, very good uh, slides and video of yards, new yards in India. As long as you're able to, de to, to develop well quality controlled elements, it's a matter of connection detailing. So everyone could do it. And you could prepare and develop open space multi story building, but not in this way, uh, not in seismic region anymore. So the multi story columns with simply supported beams on corbels should not be adopted. And this is, again, a very traditional but old way. And again, I guess that in Indonesia, you have the same problem that we have in Italy. So until a few years ago, 30, 40, 50, people thought that there were some no seismic areas in, in some countries. And now suddenly they discover that uh, you cannot mention no seismic. So there will be still something that we don't know. And so a connection detailing like this is not a matter of not performing well anymore. It's a matter of not being efficient because uh, relying upon the moment resisting connection, again, it is okay, but it's, it's like saying that a car of 1960 is okay. There are cars of 20, 20, 20, which has a much better performance and safety when compared to the, the other ones. If we think that we've been relying upon the moment resisting connection buying contact, uh, it doesn't make any sense in 2020. So you just sit something uh, in a hole and then you, 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 you have uh, obviously an hour pointer, the pointer, the recentering was not there in the past. And then you're using routing and then by relying upon contact, uh, you take the re moment resisting. That's not what we do as an engineer. As an engineer, uh, T, C, tension compression, lever arm gives you the moment. Uh, so the obvious way would be to have a foundation which is flat, having starter bars coming up, coming down with your elements and grouting in. That's what a kid will do to work on a coupling. The kid will not know about moment resistance, but will know that it will be much easier to stick something out and, and, and pull something in. So there are ways to improve all these connections, which were absolutely great. And with tiny, tiny improvement, we can make them working much more properly. And again, these are some examples again of Partly dry connection using dowels, this sort of a dowel, a vertical dowel, starting from the post 70, everywhere in the world, the columns were sitting on corbels with friction only, and then in the 70s, we started using dowels. But the dowels are not giving moment resistance. To have moment resistance, you need to make them like that. So you have to make them horizontal to have tension compression and moment resistance. Otherwise, they are simply moving a big mass element onto a very tiny column. And that's far away from, obviously, weak beam, strong column mechanism. But in some cases, we have to do something else. Because as David mentioned very properly, sometimes the beams are too big. And so there's no way to make the columns bigger than the, 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 the beam. So the other way would be to use a different lateral resisting system, which is a wall, which is let's call a bracing. So something which is providing lateral stiffness and strength and ductility. Quickly and fast, 
The advantage of concrete, of precast concrete, we know it, is uh, quality control, speed of erection, dry construction. And uh, this is one of the reasons, the quality control for which countries like India, for what I've been told, has decided to move into that, although the cost of workmanship, so the wage per hour, uh, does not justify precast concrete. Uh, the, 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 around the world, the cost per hour that is typically mentioned to justify the swap from casting sea to, 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 to precast is about 30 US dollar per hour. And uh, if you pay more, absolutely precast concrete would be more convenient, they say. If you pay less, uh, maybe not. It's not true. If you pay less, the value of quality control, the value of maintenance, the value of long, of long term is so high, but you as an engineer must do the calculation of it. And you can refer to the, the FAB Bulletin of Sustainability, for example, to come up with some numbers. To explain that uh, is not the initial cost of the structure that counts, is the cost of the structure in the lifetime. And if you don't want to see in the lifetime, because you don't know the lifetime, we say 50 years, uh, but we still have to uh, uh, demolish uh, structures after 50 years, we will never do it. So think about a good 50 years of uh, ideally light time, and you will see that the quality control uh, altogether would be a driving issue. Speed of erection is also very important. If you are in a very congested area, we don't, we don't want to say the obviousness, but people don't think about it. You want to go fast and quick, uh, and fast and quick we, means uh, uh, not wet trades, so it doesn't mean uh, uh, traffic, it doesn't mean uh, uh, noise, and so forth. But if we use this site of solutions, we don't have an efficient static schemes. So that's not a, what an earthquake engineer or what an engineer will do for lateral forces. It's not a preparing a cantilever scheme all the way up. It will be the next level up to create a moment-resistant connection. And so if we want to go to moment-resistant connection, we can also avoid PDLT effects because suddenly the, the uh, bending moment will not be a triangular shape from the top to the, to the bottom with a huge displacement, but will be a shear type. So there is so much obvious. Uh, uh, it's interesting that if we take a student, the proof is, is uh, people who don't know and they're learning. You take a student and you teach uh, reinforced concrete. And you teach, I uh, was doing in New Zealand, reinforced concrete, pre-stress concrete, precast, and you do the ductility, dry connection, wet connection at the same time. From a student point of view, that's, the, that's a normal course. It's all new. They learn as, as soon as they, they, they are asked what is easier for you to design, they say precast and pre-stressed. Because with the hand calculation, I can control everything. If you ask me to tell you, looking at a structure under deformation, what is the, the curvature of the plastic hinge? I bet you whatever you prefer, and I will be winning the bet, that you will not be able to say in us two seconds what is the curvature after a displaced structure, while you will be able to say what is the rotation, because it's a matter of displacement and height of the structure. So we don't think in curvature, we think in rotation. And so precast is more naturally uh, dealing with this uh, uh, general displacement and rotation. Let's go to the emulation. You, you know about that. Let me see the time. Emulation has been developed since ages. And you need to know, for example, it already in the 60s, in the 70s, in the ex-Soviet Union, URSS, there was a big development in the East Europe, now Russia, Ukraine, also in the Balkanic area with the precast connections, semi-precast, semi-prefabricated, becoming wet. You can find many of these detailing with suggestion of how to ensure uh, that uh, the casting C2 wet uh, and uh, not as strong as uh, uh, component of the connection will join very nicely to develop a plastic hinge in the FAB Bulletin 78, which Dr. Fernandez has mentioned. But just be aware that uh, there is a reason for which uh, this is already a big step up when compared to the uh, hinged connection, but it's still costly. A uh, big step up, we tried to develop them in, in Italy in the 1990s. There was a solution where people were a system called System K, where you see semi precast elements with the, the, the stirrups are outside and you need to cast in situ. And uh, the market did not like it. So the market thought it was in the 1990s too expensive. So we keep going. FIB Bullet in 97, 78. And now these solutions are well aware, well spread around the world, but people are still wondering. How do I do the stitching? How do I do the casting? How do I roughen the surface of the precast element in order to have the, the wet and young concrete 
uh, grabbing, grabbing together. And so step one, step two, step three, you are really following the precasting now, element, 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 and then the, there's a stitching with a wet connection. And then the holocore solution, people were asking about diaphragm of holocore, diaphragm actions, and I saw the answer, I agree. We do at this stage use the topping only for diaphragm, but to be honest, we don't know enough. So we don't really know enough about diaphragm actions uh, in seismic regions uh, with uh, complicated solutions. And the earthquake in 2011 in New Zealand, and then again 2016 in Kaikoura has shown that uh, we need to do more. And again, if we, FIB Bulletin 78, you find some proper detailing to ensure that with proper uh, big stitches, big uh, shear stirrups, uh, you are actually creating uh, what we were doing for gravity load, so avoidance of progressive collapse. The same concept of tying together a structure for gravity, which in the UK has been well developed since a while, you, we, we need to use them in seismic because the tying together is really the box, the box of type of arrangement. And so all this type of, side type of sequence is actually very fast, but I really want to put a big but, don't think it's easy. It's easy once you know it. So the big problems in uh, anything is when uh, you get some, someone on site and they think it's just uh, easy and they don't know the consequence of, for example, grouting from the top and not from the bottom. Uh, uh, an assistant uh, worker will not know the, the grout if you have an in hose and out hose. The in is from the bottom. You need to get all the grout out. And when it goes out, it's obvious for precaster, but it's not obvious for normal workers. So issues happen because detailing are not well understood. It's just a matter of explaining. And we did test in the lab showing that if you grout as if it was a water in the flowers, you will see that the connection will not be working because the dust and the, and the and everything remains inside. If you grout from the bottom, then you get a proper a proper issue. So all of these type of sequence, very very simple and easy, needs to be I would say explained on day one with a contractor. You sit down, you make sure that did you understand exactly what is the sequence and how you are going to pour your grout, and obviously the grout. I totally agree should be as much as possible, depending on the solution, no shrinking grout. But let's remember the issue. I prefer to have the, a shrinking grout poured from the bottom to the top that a beautiful non shrinking grout extremely faintly pulled from the top to the bottom. It doesn't make any sense. So again, the construction detailing is fundamental, which doesn't mean drawings, it means execution on site. And so you need to have a proper people on site to follow up. David already explained that while I'm showing that, because basically this is already going versus a dry connection. We are still having a lot of wet connection. There are plenty of solutions in Italy that uh, since the L'Aquila earthquake, after the L'Aquila earthquake in 2009, there were plenty of these solutions coming up, being revamped. Uh, they were not known in the past, and then people accepted that uh, we need to do something more. And so you see, development, for example, in Italy of this type of connections with corbels, which are becoming smaller, with U-shape uh, elements uh, becoming uh, the way to accommodate uh, the bars, which are sliding through and giving the moment resistant connection. And again, in the FAB Bulletin 78, uh, we put, uh, we highlighted as much as possible the very important issues uh, that you might face with any connection detailing. For example, if you want to grout, has been questioned very properly. If you grout uh, the connection within a column and a, and a, and a beam and they, are, and they are already dry, uh, this is called a cold joint, as you well know. And the cold joint in the industry is a delicate issue. You don't have to treat the cold joint like uh, simply casting concrete and hoping the concrete will cure against the new concrete. So roughening the surface is fundamental and also adding some special additive between young concrete and, and old concrete and nowadays are available. How do I know about that? By experience, which is you make a mistake, you remember that. We were in the lab, we did not roughen the surface properly. I instructed to have this roughening happening. It did not happen properly. Or, or in addition, there was no proper additive to the concrete. And so the concrete column to foundation connection, the foundation was a cold joint because it was already done. The column did not develop a plastic hinge. A New Zealand detailing for a column to foundation connection developed a single crack. If you develop a single crack, the ductility goes to the 
goes very small because you are increasing very much the, the, the deformation demand to the bar. So be very careful in making sure that uh, either mechanically, mechanical shear keys are quite expensive, but at least by proper roughening the surface and adding an addictive, you can have proper solution. Now, these are interesting solutions, which are uh, interesting development, which I like to show from Turkey, where the old way of doing big elements on the top of big, of big elements with dowels has been changed with just a detailing. So the precaster does not have to be scared about changing anything. It's just a matter of the last portion of the connection with proper confinement, proper enforcing, but it's just changing here. It's not changing the full long span 45 meters beam. And again, uh, there's been already shown uh, in, uh, in India, very interesting development of precasting with different solutions. So forth. these slides will be given to you so you can appreciate. New Zealand, a double cruciform, very old, very good. Uh, the more you connect elements, uh, the more you pay. So you want to minimize the number of connections. And to minimize the number of connections, you have to pay the crane. So you want to use, if possible, a bigger crane and try to double up the connection. This is a double cruciform connection connected over here, 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 here on the top. But even better than that, there is an horizontal connection. So these are examples of uh, what you can do in terms of, uh, again, uh, emulation. And these are, again, example about emulation in New Zealand of buildings uh, that were being built before the earthquake. And then I will explain you what happens after the earthquake. Wet connection becoming, uh, becoming caster. Again, once you have this type of solutions, so the problem is the span. So we want to exploit concrete in the form of precast concrete. So we should be going for longer span using precast pre-stressed. But if we are not doing so, then the problem will become uh, uh, that we have a long, a short span. And the short span here is about, about uh, four meters. So you don't want to use precast pre-stressed or precast unpre-stressed for four meter long. It doesn't make any sense. You would like to go for eight meters, for 10 meters in a building. So one of the option, again, uh, is uh, uh, to, to use precast is to develop, uh, and I show you a building in, uh, in the University of Canterbury, a double cruciform horizontally. Again, the problem is that you look at the span length, the span length is very short. Give me a second because, give me just a second, because I need the, uh, I need to connect my, my battery. Uh, hold, hold on a, a second, because I disconnected the battery. And if the computer dies, just one second. There I am. Here I am back. So very quickly, this is the precaster. Again, very good evolution starting from the hinge connection. Excellent evolution from a management point of view, because you're basically bringing your structure up with a double, double cruciform element. Horizontal double cruciform is much easier to connect than a vertical one, but you're not using a full length of the beam because by definition, you're bringing a big element and by definition, you're not able to have, unless you do pre-stressing internally, a long span solution. So this is from the top, you see the fit is from the top, uh, as been mentioned, mechanical couplers, if you do it properly, they work very well. This is a U-shaped beam. It's an holo core. We see the voids of the holo core sitting transversely to the U-shaped beam. And then the reinforcement, instead of sliding through, is mechanical couple. Can be extremely fast. But I want to show you the problem. Again, limitation. So it's the second generation. The first generation was each connection. The second generation is becoming wet connection, moment resisting, but they do not exploit the advantage of precast. The, the advantage being a really fast speed, a really a single mold that can be used for many, many units. So not a different type of solution with a half beam casted and half beam with the stirrups being outside. So there is a slowdown of direction speed. It's not bad, but it's still, slower than what it could be. And then there's a complexity of the connection. So there's not underestimated the complexity because the, at the end, once you know what you're doing, it's okay. But one by one, you still need to detail them as if it was cast in situ concrete. More importantly, it was, uh, it's a slide that I've been using ages ago, but people of 1990s, but people obviously did not buy the performance in seismic areas. It was not an important, uh, objective performance, life safety was the minimum and, and the objective. Ductility here of a moment resisting connection means plastic hinge, which means damage, which is absolutely appropriate 
if we go back to when it was developed. So the concept of ductility design to have material damage. But Park and Pauli never said that uh, ductility should become damaged. They said it's a compromise until we get a better, te better technology. And so the question is, and you, are, uh, you know what, where I'm going, do we have today a technology which is allowing to give you ductility? while exploiting the precast concrete in the full speed and quality control, but without giving you damage? And the answer is uh, absolutely yes. We have it since a while, and I'm going to show you very quickly. So fast and quick. New Zealand earthquake, 2010, 2011, big shaking. Unfortunately, the Christchurch City County, CBD, the central building district was affected significantly. Buildings design according to uh, uh, weak, be weak columns here and strong beams, so the older way, although there was a wall, so pre-70 collapsed. But also building a design with precast in uh, without proper detaining. The problem here was not the detaining between the precast units and the lateral resisting system, sorry, the beam and column, but between the diaphragm and the wall. Again, it's a detailing that in the past, the 1980s, people were not very aware about. And so there was a major issue about buildings. But look at this. This is probably the best example textbook of how to do emulation of casting C2 concrete for a multi-story building. We are talking about uh, uh, the Grand Chancellor. No, sorry, this is a price a PWC. PricewaterhouseCooper Hotel, 20, uh, uh, building, not hotel, building, 22 story in the, let me see if I can, if I can move this away, 22 story, and it was done in the emulation of cast in situ. So very properly, if you can see on the right hand side, you have uh, element being connected with element, and then you cast in situ, not the connection itself, but outside the connection. So you cast in situ mixed pan. And that is the best ever plastic inch we have, we, which we have seen around the world. There's nothing any better than this textbook, because typically we see in the lab, but, we have not seen until this, uh, this earthquake uh, a real well-designed uh, capacity design, weak beam, strong connection building uh, being uh, displaced by a severe earthquake. And that's what we get, exactly what you wanted. We, 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 uh, uh, we have the opportunity to see a plastic hinge. The plastic hinge develops very nicely, but we don't know how to repair it. So the down, the problem of the Christchurch earthquake is that uh, Reinforced concrete, steel, precast concrete, anything designed very properly in a ductile mode, if ductility was delivered through material as it should be, then it was demolished because we didn't know how, how to repair it. So now you're designing, the question is to you, you're designing the future in Indonesia, the next structures, and you are expecting big earthquakes in Indonesia. You're not having uh, earthquakes happening every 100 years. We saw, unfortunately, you have big earthquakes happening very frequently. So you are going to expect something like this. How could you explain to your client? How could you explain to the community that you deliver the best by code design? No, you deliver the minimum by code design. The minimum by code design is delivering something which is going to have life safety at the time where an earthquake comes. So. Mr. Chairman, how much time I have? Five minutes, three, three minutes? Okay, maybe you can have uh, 10 more minutes for our presentation because it's still very interesting. Excellent. Uh, uh, now we are entering into, I, I, I held you on, on, on tight on the seat uh, and you were wondering, so what else? See the consequence of a well-developed uh, modern country, seismic design-wise construction, what happens when all these buildings and others uh, are in troubles. These are all good buildings, tall buildings, well-designed. They've been all demolished. So there's a video, you, you, if you run the video and it's a Canterbury Earthquake uh, Recovery Authority, CIRA in New Zealand, you see multiple multi-story reinforced concrete precast emulative buildings uh, being demolished because it was too complicated to, to, uh, to repair them. The impact for the society was 25% uh, of the gross domestic product, 25% of the GDP, 40 billion New Zealand dollars. Uh, I don't know how much is in your country. It's a huge amount of money in, even for Italy. But New Zealand is made of 4 million people, not 65 million. So if uh, I was mentioning that uh, there was a big earthquake, with 25% of GDP, gross domestic product impact, with uh, the second city of the country being disrupted completely, then people say, how did they survive? And the reason 
the country economically survived. The reason was a very special insurance scheme between uh, government and private. So there was a half, half hybrid uh, insurance scheme whereby, just to give an idea, my house itself uh, was insured for Airquick for 50 New Zealand dollars, which is 30 euros. So basically three beers. With three beers, you were able to have a full coverage because everyone was paying. But the reality is that you don't, you don't give back the, the lack of commodity and the disaster for the country. Insurance doesn't give you back the life, does allow you to go back. So when we talk about resilience, resilience is a concept that, uh, that people think it's a fake, a vague, uh, uncertain, it's just uh, ideal. Actually, it's a mathematical calculation can be calculated mathematically nowadays, which is the lack or impact of a performance of a city and then how much you take up. This disruption, the, the hole that we are going through and then we take time to re, uh, recover as a humongous economical social impact. So if we were able to calculate that economical social impact for your single building, for your neighbor, for your city, for your country, here is uh, the reason for which uh, there is uh, one best option around the world. So against what I said before, uh, you choose your best option, yes. But once you choose your best option, then becomes very clear that uh, if you make a proper calculation for social community and sustainability, then you need to use precast in a specific way. So not everything will deliver you the same performance to the society. So it's quite obvious what you need. I go through, you know very well, the matrix of size we design. And you know very well that we have been told since 1990s that the big new performance base was to design for life safety under a 500 years return period earthquake, which means 10% of probability of occurrence in 50 years. What does it mean? It means that if we get the earthquake we design for, our building will be destroyed, damaged severely because we only targeted life safety. That's not sufficient enough. So means that we are telling people that we are designing them, these for them. And people are thinking that we should be delivering, I don't know if you see my, my mouse, hopefully you do. Let me see. We are delivering, they ask us earthquake proof, they ask us for this, and we are delivering that, telling that that's exactly what we are designing, a perfect design, that's not acceptable. And the question is, how much does it take from a technology and expensive point of view to go from here to at least here, which is damage control, to there, which is a low, very, very low damage. Now, the ultimate goal, Please read by yourself, but is we made a mistake in not communicating to the people that the code is not meant to be the target. The code is the minimum by law. If you go below the code, you go to jail. So it's a quite hard expression to say that the code is a compromise to get something done because the cost otherwise would be higher. No one ever proved how much higher would be the cost. We have a recent publication that we published in June to show exactly how much a higher technology can deliver you better performance with lower cost. So I will give you the references. So what we call, we call technical people earthquake resistance, people think earthquake proof. So don't ever use earthquake proof if you can, because uh, it's not appropriate and explain to people that their earthquake proof uh, can be done only if we were pushing, uh, pushing the performance uh, for a very high level of earthquake. We want to be on a fully operation. That will be an earthquake proof. Now we are able to push to a damage control. And so here we are. This is what we've been delivering to people. You design according to the best Indonesian code, you design according to the best Italian, Euro code eight, uh, um, New Zealand code uh, and US code, Japanese code, just to mention some of them around the world. And that's what you want to have, a plastic injured beam. You are going to have damage in the flooring system because they're not rigid just because you tick on the software rigid floor. So it doesn't mean that the floor will be rigid. The floor will have to accommodate the plastic hinge. The plastic hinge is pushing, is deforming, is pushing out. So there is an elongation. Obviously, all known structural elements, uh, jibs, partitions, uh, claddings, uh, infills, uh, facades, ceilings uh, will be damaged. It's well known by the code, but people will not accept that something like this will happen. So we have to make a big change. And, it's difficult to make with existing buildings, but we can do for new buildings. Dr. Fernandez mentioned model code 2020, which is going to be the next generation of codes in a way. So we are able to introduce now in the model code 2020, the concept of low damage, the concept of repairability, the concept of designing for high performance 
for a given intensity of an earthquake. So here is the one of the solutions available in the form of jointed ductile, we call them. They are jointed and they are ductile, hybrid, also we call it, or, or even better low damage connection. I go fast and quick. Starts from the press development in the States in 1990s. It was a, a big project, US press project. The press means, means precast seismic structure system. It was a, a way to, for the industry in precast to answer the big question, how can we survive? Because the prejudice against precast was so bad that people were not using precast in high seismic region like California anymore. People were going for steel. So the precast industry had two choices. One, hold on tight and hope not to disappear to invest for next uh, development. And this is something so brilliant that is so difficult to explain when there is a recession time. What should you be doing a recession time? If you keep uh, lowering the cost, uh, you will die in a longer time. If you try to, you need to have obviously you know, the, the, the challenge, the, 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 you need to take the challenge, try to go for the next level up and you take obviously a risk, you are increasing your level of your probability of survival. So this is the press building. This myself 20 more years ago and 20 more kg kilos ago. I was much slender, still very tall. I, I couldn't, I didn't show too much, but I, I, I also uh, uh, swallowed uh, horizontally. Precast walls vertically, big test on a five-story building, but I want to show you, you keep going, uh, rocking walls, uh, post-tensioning vertically. This becomes, it's supposed to be something that you uh, might know from the seismic uh, uh, precast bulletin that I will be showing you from the FIB since a while. And the concept is that instead of accepting the damage uh, into this plastic hinge, we now take the Greek, uh, ancient Greek rocking temple concept. So basically, the pre, you see, it's precast, has to be precast. The precast elements are going back and forth. A tie down, which is made of vertical or horizontal unbonded, because we, they want to remain elastic uh, tendons or bars, is give you the restoring. You push and you get it back. You push and you get it back. And you don't have this damage, but you basically open and close air. And while you close open and close air, you're using uh, normal, I go back, normal reinforcing bar with a little bit of an unbonded length to preserve the strain, the deformation, the, the excessive deformation for, to, from breaking the bar. And so basically you allow this rocking, it's called controlled rocking. So you rock and you dissipate because while you move, you dissipate. And by doing that, basically we are 2000 years and 500 years later, we are doing what the Greek were doing. They did not have dissipators. They did not have uh, post-tensioning. They were using marble, rocking on the top of each other, and they were sustaining the earthquake by basically using this basic concept. Now we are improving by having a vertical tie down, which is giving moment capacity, axial load capacity, as well as a recentering because it's a axial, axial uh, uh, is never a P delta, plus dissipators everywhere you can. This is a major breakthrough because it means that uh, from pre-70, building collapsing because of weak columns and strong beam, soft story. Then post-70, Park and Poly, capacity design principle and the, the chain, the, the theory of the chain, the chain capacity is equal to the weakest link. The weakest link should be ductile. Absolutely, yes. What is the next step up? The weakest link should be ductile, but if possible, repairable. That's the next generation. So pre-70, and that's what we got until yesterday. And what, what we get today is, uh, imagine that this were done by my students in New Zealand. We are talking about 21 years old, the students of Reinforced Concrete 101. They built their own beam, beam column joint pre-70, failing in shear. They built with their own hands and they tested in the lab. Then we, we tested a plastic hinge. We see we are in 2004, a plastic hinge according to the New Zealand code, the 3101. And then the same students, knowing nothing about reinforced concrete ever, they just learn about precast, post-tension, unbonded, mild steel, and they develop a nice gap, which is not damaging. You ask to those students, and many of them have been designing buildings with that, what was easy to design, and they don't say this because they can't see the curvature. They say, oh, the legal one, the one which is being assembled very fast and very quick. So the next step has been in our development the last 20 years, uh, starting uh, in Italy and then in New Zealand for 16, uh, uh, the repairability of the weakest link. How quick we can make it? 
Imagine reinforced concrete with the cage not being uh, covered by concrete altogether, but in the connection, you don't want to use, you could, but you can change the internal rebars to become external. So the moment resisting connection become external, and then you have a rebar, which is the same uh, basically diameter, but we create a fuse. So it's a fuse bar such that you create a really a seismic fuse intention it's going to yield. When you go into compression, you don't want to buckle. So you prepare a, a anti-buckling tube as cheap as a tube and you grout with epoxy or with a mortar, the tube. So basically you have a device which we call plug and play. And you might be very happy to know that the reason for which I'm still an academic and I'm, I did not buy any many Greek islands is because I did not patent this plug and play concept. I intentionally intended that to remain available for everyone. So please use it at one condition that you don't change the name to, to our son. If you give a name which is plug and play, please don't change the name to a fake commercial name, which I found in some countries I can't tell you, and unfortunately in my country, Italy too, where people pretended to have developed something new and they gave a name to my plug and play. It's like saying that my name is Stefano and, you, uh, and, and, and someone calls me John. My name is Stefano, it's been given to me and I will be called Stefano all the time. So you will not pay any royalty for this. We're go, going to provide you all the information to develop. What is becoming a really the seismic fuse? You want to have an extra small, you want to have a medium, a large. So imagine, and as an engineer, we have been developing enough testing to have your discrete solution, 10, 20 kilonewton, 40, 50, 150, 250. So as an engineer, you pick up out of the table your size with the full shape and geometry, and you do some testing like you'll be doing for, for any rebar testing, just to prove the tensile capacity. And after an earthquake, what do you do? After an earthquake, if you have to change after anything, if you had to change a light bulb, my joke to non-technical people is that you don't need to be an electrical engineer to change a light bulb, right? So you don't need an earthquake engineer to change a dissipator. If we develop and we hey, have- Professor, you have uh, two more minutes. Okay, so I'll show you a, a video. If you, if you have a plug and play dissipators, then like a light bulb, you basically literally go and buy from the seismic shop uh, solutions and you're going yourself to tie the solution in, which can be, can have different architectural, architectural appearance. Design code, very fast and quick. FIB 2004, bulletin 27. Please go and take it because it was a major development. Uh, Professor Bob Park, late Professor Bob Park and Professor Fumio Matanabe were chairing this uh, this uh, um, code committee, which in 2004 was already explaining what was available at that time. And then it has been mentioned by Dr. Fernandez, the FIB Bulletin 78, uh, chaired by our uh, great friend, uh, uh, Professor Spiro Sukantas, uh, with uh, big developments in terms of detailing. Uh, and then in New Zealand, uh, there is a code that you could, could use. So the New Zealand 3101 code 2006 allowed you to use joint ductile connection in displacement based design. More so, we developed a press design handbook, a full design detail, uh, uh, example of a five-story building for frames and walls uh, that you can go for the, to the concrete society and get. And fast and quick, because I have two minutes, uh, buildings, 39-story uh, buildings in the United States, the tallest so far. In Italy, that's what we developed, even in Italy, for low seismic region with the draped tenons, long span. Argentina, Costa Rica, New Zealand, where we used for the first time because we were developing over there the plug and play. And you can see here, dry connection, no, no propping whatsoever, fast and quick. These are becoming dissipators. This building is an ad, another building that was in Christchurch with the semi precast solutions, but still precast post tensioning, rocking dissipative. It went through the earthquake. The big earthquake in February 2011, it was unskated basically. So very low level of damage. It was a hospital facility. It went through the uh, media, people say, what's going on? There are buildings collapsing everywhere and that building, uh, it must have costed so much money. We say, no, it costed actually less. It's just using a new technology. I'm finishing through. Police station in Rotorua, we develop a design with walls rocking and many dissipators to show to people and to plug them off when you wish. So the idea is, if I can show a video, to develop a building which is a low damage altogether, not only the skeleton, but also the facades and you're going to see references and the partition of the inference. We have all this detailing. Let me see if it works. If it does work, hopefully. 
let me check because I want to see the rocking. It makes uh, counts thousands of words. Tell me if you can see it. Can you see it? Yes, Professor. Okay, check here. That's a frame with the post tensioning going through and the rocking occurs over here and we have top and bottom dissipator. Basically, we had 100 earthquakes and we couldn't get any damage. So we continue on, we continue on, but I need to go out. There you are. We continue on and uh, let me show the, this and then I stop, which is the rocking of the connection itself. So you can see how simple this, look at here, the Greek temple is rocking, the post tensioning is holding back. There is a little bit of important detailing to avoid the concrete to spoil, which is a, a cleat, and then dissipators on top and bottom. These buildings can go and we tested many and many, and now I will be, I will go into the end. This building with the facades, uh, with different type of detailing, we have been testing and please go to the web website here. You can see a full presentation of a 3D shaking table, which we did in Lisbon, because the idea was to prove that even in Europe, we can go for a fully hybrid system. And so we took a, a big test with, a, and that's the last one, with a big shaking table, a full skeleton with concrete and timber together to show that we can use different type of material, concrete columns, precast concrete facades, uh, concrete timber floors uh, and timber walls and beams. And we were going through uh, collapse prevention earthquakes uh, and having uh, basically a low damage. How much does it cost? If you think about the cost of a telephone and the performance uh, in the past, uh, they've been increasing performance, decreasing cost. Computer, increasing performance, decreasing cost. Precast, uh, increasing performance and uh, equal cost uh, finishing now. Why don't we use it? Because we didn't know. It's just a matter of knowing. Thank you very much for your, your attention. I have hundreds of people that I need to acknowledge because there are many, like Tom Pauli was saying, victims of the research that have been participating and many uh, squads coming to New Zealand to help us during the earthquake. And so again, very much uh, thank you for the patience. I know that I went through more than the time allowed. Uh, and uh, um, if there are any questions, if the, 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 the chair will allow, otherwise I will give you some materials to read. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Professor Pampanin, for the very inspiring and interesting presentation. We, we, uh, I myself learned many things new for me. And uh, we have some questions here in the chat room, but we, we will not be able to accommodate all the questions. I will read uh, only some of the questions. The first one is from Mr. Ricky. The question is, we have seen some buildings in New Zealand using the self-centering rocking ball system. And what are the limitations of the rocking ball system? And is it possible to use it in a high-rise building? This is the question. Very good question. So first of all, walls are very much uh, 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 an excellent system when compared to frames for what we not in precast, generally speaking. We have been learning too much about the plastic hinge beam elongation giving troubles to the flooring system. So if we go back to again, the Tom Poli best system was the dual system, frames and walls. And uh, in Chile, even uh, walls because they give you stiffness and so low displacement. So walls, if you could, are preferable. It's a matter of architecture. And the, the limitation is a matter again of detailing because uh, by having a wall, if it's too long, you create a lot of uh, 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 tearing, so a lot of stress. But one of the good ways to decouple them. So instead of having a long wall rocking, you can decouple them and couple them with the U-shaped flexural plates. So there are means, if you go to the press designing book and the bulletin, uh, the FIB bulletins, 2004, 2016, you'll find many of these uh, solutions available. So it's definitely an excellent system to be used. And for multi-story building, absolutely. We, we had a feasibility study with Takenaka Corporation in Japan for a 40 plus story building using uh, walls connected with vertical post tension, which, which are coupling and the system uh, feasible, feasibility wise, uh, uh, performance and cost makes a lot of sense. Okay, uh, thank you, Professor, for the answer. For the next question is from Mr. Joe. So the question is about the structural modeling. 
So if we want to perform a linear dynamic analysis considering seismic descent, maybe it's a nonlinear, he mean. Is there any specific recommendation to include the proper structural stiffness for the precast elements such as slab, beam, column, or even the connections for the structural modeling? Thanks, very good question. So because you're talking about a linear dynamic analysis, uh, I should say, if you could, uh, you in use this type of system, you can perform a by hand. I'm not kidding, uh, students can do it. A by hand pushover using Excel, which is much more ac accurate than a dynamic analysis from the computer. Reason being that in, as you know, in the dynamic analysis, you are extrapolating an elastic response into an elastoplastic. So it's not really, uh, uh, um, providing you the correct information. It's, it's allowed by the code though. So my suggestion would be to do a moment curvature of the critical sections, if you really need to do a linear dynamic analysis and provide the stiffness second to the yielding point into your elastic equivalent element. Because remember that we are working on elastoplastic equivalents. So moment curvature of the critical section, and then you deliver, you use that for your dynamic analysis. The other way is literally a by hand pushover, and then you can use your dynamic analysis for a double check. Okay. And if, if uh, let's say I'm, I'm increasing further the questions, but if if want to modulate for the nonlinear dynamic, is there any recommendation for the connection elements? Yes, yes. Uh, the, the, the beauty is that the, because the system is uh, rocking in critical interface, uh, we have been focusing the modeling to be a lump to plasticity, means springs. So you can concentrate in nonlinearity using a moment rotation spring. And the way to develop the moment rotation, which is not a moment curvature, is even easier. It's again by hand using Excel. You can find all of that in the press designing book. And to tell you again the difficulty, if you don't know, it looks complicated. My students, undergrad, undergrad, they learn it and they found it so simply. Simple. It's a matter of uh, going through the steps. So obviously not knowing where to start from looks complicated, but you go through the press designing book to some of our publications and uh, you can by hand do the moment rot rotation and then you use a sub 2000, ETABS, uh, RUAMOC, OpenSeas uh, to have a ro uh, moment rotation. The columns are elastic, the beams are elastic. There's only a spring at the interface connection. So very simple. Okay, thank you for your answer. And I think because of the time, maybe uh, one more question. This is from Mr. Gambiro. Uh, Professor Pamelin, what is the percentage damage rate of hybrid structures compared to traditional structures? Maybe uh, the damage, oh, let's say, okay. if we so, subject it let's to earthquake. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's say the if you design for life safety, a uh, traditional structure, you deliver life safety, which means uh, significant damage through the plastic hinges, significant no structural element damage. If you design uh, uh, using a uh, low damage technology, your, your earthquake is still uh, the 500 years, uh, but you are delivering uh, uh, at least a damage control level. So if you think in the matrix, uh, means uh, very low need to repair the structural system, and depending on the drift, which is your choice, it's a displacement-based design, a possibly lower uh, um, need to repair the non-structural elements. If you combine the low damage skeleton with low damage infills, which we've been developing, then you really have a full low damage solution, which means that the cost of repairing, we have been quantifying that, are very, very few percentage when compared to the traditional system. So it's a major economic uh, um, advantage. Okay, thank you. About the base resolution and precast, let me, let me read and tell you, absolutely we've done it. It was uh, something that I've been pushing for a few years uh, and people were, as usual, skeptically saying, uh, why do you need to create a monster so expensive? It's not a monster. If you take base resolution, on the top, you have a problem of forces which can go bigger than what you thought. And so in some codes, uh, you still use a Q factor or R factor for the superstructure. So the obviousness uh, the proposed, and we delivered a real building, was to combine rocking on the base with low damage on the top, less expensive. This combined with that is absolutely brilliant. And if you go through some of my recent publication, you will find a, a, a solution where there is a, a San Telmo course, where we had base resolution on the bottom, 
concrete uh, columns, precast, sorry, uh, um, uh, press lamb, pre press laminated timber beams uh, with draped tenons. Uh, so you have really a combination. It's a beauty. It's a beauty and it costs less uh, than base isolation alone and it costs less than an uh, equal, equal, I would say, than a traditional solution. Okay, thank you, Professor, for the answer. I think uh, we need to stop here due to the time. Uh, thank you, Professor, once again thank for, you for sharing your the invitation knowledge. for listening. Yeah, thank you for your sharing your experience. I think we should give applause for Professor Papanin. Okay, uh, in conclusion for the session, I would like to say thank you for our speakers for sharing uh, knowledge and expertise with all of us. I believe what has been shared can enhance our knowledge and understanding in precast concrete structure for seismic region building, especially in Indonesia. I also want, would like to thank you for our participant who has been joining this webinar from the start until now. And last but not least, I also would like to apologize if there is any mistake during this webinar. Thank you. I return back to the MC. Yeah, MC, please. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Jimmy Chandra, for moderating the second session. And also, thank you for all the speakers. Finally, we've arrived at the end of this webinar. I would like to welcome the rector of Petra Christian University, Professor Juantoro Harjito, to give the closing remarks and certificate appreciation for the speakers. Okay. Thank you, uh, MC. And very good afternoon to all. Very glad to have all of you in the seminar. My highest appreciation to all involved, especially to our respected speakers, participants, moderators, and of course, the committee. So thank you very much for FIB and FIB Indonesia for the invaluable support given. Yeah. So I'm very glad today that our civil engineering department, Petra Christian University, in close collaboration with FIB Indonesia, hosting this seminar. Yeah, with the very interesting topics for the latest advancement of precast concrete design and construction in seismic in high seismic region buildings. So in my view, precast concrete is an alternative uh, solution or excellent alternative solution. Yeah, especially on the need to apply sustainable development principles in construction industry. So in this initiative, we can make sure that uh, the concrete elements we produce are of, of, good, uh, of excellent quality, economical, having very high durability, while elevating efficient use of materials, especially the virgin one. So just a brief in, uh, introduction about uh, our university, yeah. So this year we mark our 60th anniversary of our university, Petra Christian University. So in these uh, 60 years, Petra Christian University has emerged as one premier uh, private universities in Indonesia. Uh, okay, uh, to conclude my to conclude my congratulations to all of the participants of this seminar for your active participation, for our Department of Civil Engineering, yeah, and of course for all involved in this seminar. We do hope that uh, this seminar will really uh, uh, providing you with a very valuable information on the latest uh, advancement of precast concrete elements. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, and God bless you. All. And um, and now please, Professor Juandoro, to give the certificate for our honorable speakers. Yes, thank you.
So uh, symbolically uh, to represent all the committee and all of the participants, I would like to present the certificate of appreciation to all of the speakers. This is the, uh, first of all, to Dr. Hari Nugraha Nurjaman. Thank you. Yeah. And then followed by uh, to the second speaker. Yeah. Mr. I'm sorry if uh, I pronounce it wrongly. Yeah. Mr. Vaiba Singha. So thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And to the third speaker. Yeah. To all dearest Dr. David Fernandez Ordonez, uh, the Secretary General of FIB International. So thank you very, uh, yeah, for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Last but not least, to Professor Stefano Pampanin. So, Thank you very much for your Thank invaluable you. presentation in this seminar. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor Juandoro, for your closing remarks. We do share mutual belief as we do feel utterly grateful for our notable and exceptional speakers time so we could gain a handful of great comprehensive insights that are applicable towards our professional life later on. On behalf of the organizing committees, I would like to apologize for any misconducts and mistakes that our committees might have done throughout this event. And once again, we would like to say our utmost appreciation and gratitude to all of our speakers for giving such informative and enlightening insights, and for our dearest moderators for moderating the excellent webinar and also the participants for, for participating in this event. Once again, thank you very much for your participation and attention. For your information, the next webinar series will be conducted two weeks again on 11 September, 2021. Ladies and gentlemen, before you leave this room, Please fill the evaluation questionnaire and your data for the certificate of this webinar. With this being said, I'm Pamela Audrey as the host of Pika's Webinar 2021. We would like to thank you for your attention. See you at the next event. Okay, uh, participant can check the chat for the questionnaire and certificate uh, will be sent to you after the event. And I will also share the uh, presentation from the speakers. Thank you, everyone. I hope to see you again soon. Uh, thank you again for our speakers. Uh, yeah, I will unmute. So everybody can say hi. Everybody can say and unmute themselves. So. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Nice being here. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Tepe. Thank you, Professor Papanin. Have a good one. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank 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 you. Silahkan diisi Bapak Ibu untuk sertifikatnya. It was very nice. Happy, are you still there?